sound can play an important part in the way that you get pleasure from watching birds. I'd like to explain a little about bird vocalisation and how by understanding a few simple basics such as pitch, rhythm and tone and the difference between songs and calls these can often tell you more about a bird than visual features alone. It's surprising just how many people seem to go around with their eyes closed but even more also go around with their ears shut to the world of sound around them. They probably walk straight on by this robin hidden in the hedge, singing its beautiful sub song quietly to itself, and missing out on the chance to see and hear this intriguing intimate moment in the life of the robin. When you stop and listen, you can almost imagine that this performance is being put on especially for your benefit. Bird watching is not just about seeing, it's also about listening and seeing with your ears. When you look at something, you actually see what's there in front of you. And it's easy to describe its size, its shape, its colour and its movement. But sound is different. Sound is far more ethereal and open to personal interpretation. It's capable of evoking memories and creating moods and ambience. These plaintive calls of the waders evoke memories of my childhood in Shropshire where there were familiar sound over the wet, low-lying fields around where I lived. There are a number of birds that like to sing in the evening when the toils of the day are over. The evening song of the robin can be described as melodious and the familiar beautiful song of the blackbird as mellow and tuneful. The song thrush is another bird that likes to sing at dusk and it can have up to 80 different phrases in its beautiful musical extravaganza. Once you consciously start to listen, you'll be surprised just how much is out there to be heard and how often you will hear something well before you see it and sometimes you may never see it at all. Today we live in a fast moving and noisy stressful world. I can think of no better antidote to all this than a walk in spring through one of our many parks or mixed woodlands, surrounded by singing birds celebrating the arrival of one of my favourite seasons. Or a gentle stroll up one of the valleys in the South Shropshire Hills, with singing warblers in the trees and non-stop singing of skylarks overhead, as well as the occasional distant call of buzzards and ravens. Welcome to my guide to understanding bird songs and calls. This is not meant to be a full guide to identifying all bird songs and calls, but more an introduction to understanding some of the fundamentals that go to make up all bird vocalisations and to try and understand their meanings and the difference between songs and calls. Then perhaps use this understanding of the three basic things tone, rhythm and pitch that make each song or call individual into a mental picture that will stay with you and make bird identification much easier. Or if you just enjoy listening to the birds singing Knowing a little bit more about the meanings behind them can greatly increase the pleasure you get from these encounters. Before we start to analyse any songs or calls, it's worth taking a look at a spectrogram and some of the structure of bird song. Spectrograms and sonograms are a very useful aid as they convert sound into a visual format that shows the pitch, rhythm, volume and tone of sound. The top panel is a waveform and shows the intensity or volume of the sound against the horizontal time scale. Below this we have a far more informative frequency spectrogram which shows the frequency or pitch against the horizontal time scale and also the volume of the sound by the intensity of the marks. They also show the rhythm and tone of any sound.
It's a fact that you're far more likely to hear a bird before you see it. So it's helpful if you can memorize mental pictures of bird songs and calls. You may have heard the expression, seeing with your ears. Well, this is where the spectrogram is so useful in helping you form this picture and storing it in your memory. When you hear this high-low, two-note repetitive song, you should easily be able to visualize the pattern and recognize it as the song of the great tit. One of the first things to understand is the difference between a song and a call. In the birding world, they're defined not so much by their sound as by their function. The primary function of a song, usually sung by the male in the breeding season, is to attract a female partner, who will often select a male by the quality of its song. Another use of the song is as a threat or a warning to other birds to keep out of its territory. The robin is very territorial, is a good example of this, and can often be heard singing in the winter. The female can also be heard singing outside the breeding season, when she holds a separate territory of her own. Calls, on the other hand, are usually short vocalizations used for communication within species. Their functions are not always easy to attribute can often depend on the circumstances in which they're used. One definite function is the contact call, as used here by a pair of lifelong bullfinches, to keep in touch with each other in dense undergrowth. Another important function of the call is when it's used as an alarm or a warning to other birds of imminent danger. It can be a very short, high-pitched alarm call to warn of danger from the area of predators like the sparrowhawk, where the bird itself doesn't want to give away its position, or a much louder aggressive type of warning call for ground predators such as the domestic cat, where the bird doesn't mind giving away its position and will often make its presence known to try and distract the predator. A good example of the short sharp alarm call is the great tit, who acts as a lookout for mixed groups of roaming tits in the autumn and its alarm call is recognised by all in the group. The great tit has learned that it can use this to its advantage by making false alarm calls to scare off other birds and have a lucrative source of food all to itself. You can see here how one short high-pitched call from the great tit sends all the house sparrows flying for cover. It's not always obvious at first to decide whether you're listening to a song or a call. Just listen to these three different examples. The somewhat monotonous, repeated sound of the great tit. The very simple, repetitive sound made by the chiff chaff. And finally, the z noise made by the greenfinch. Although they don't conform to our preconceived idea of tuneful bird songs, they are all in fact songs, as the function is to attract female partners. Most bird songs, though, are more complex and usually more melodic. And the female is said to select its new partner by the quality of its song. The better the song, the fitter the singer to father its offspring. Using the criteria of function, this drumming by the great spotted woodpecker must also be considered as a song, as it is used both to attract a partner and to mark out its territory. Recognising the rhythm of a song or a call can be very helpful in identifying birds, as can recognising the tempo or rate of delivery of these sounds. Noticing silent pauses and any change in the rate of delivery can also be helpful. Here we have three examples of ticking or rattling calls that sound very different because of their different rhythms and rates of delivery. Recognising the rhythm and rate of delivery of songs and calls is a great aid in identifying birds. This wren appears to deliver its very rapid ticks at a constant rate of about 28 notes per second in half second bursts with a pause of between one and two seconds between each burst of calls. 
But if you now take a bit closer look, we can see that the ticks are not delivered at a constant rate. The intervals increase from 30 milliseconds at the start to 45 milliseconds by the end of each burst. The frequency analysis shows that although each pulse of the call only lasts less than 3 one hundredths of a second, it contains a wide range of frequency peaks, which gives the sound a recognisable timbre or quality. Robin ticks are slower than the wrens and delivers at about 14 ticks per second in variable size groups with variable silent pauses between them. The spectrogram shows that each tick comprises a wide range of notes that make for a distinctive timber or quality to the sound. The black caps ticks are completely random in their number, grouping and spacing and are far less defined in the spectrogram and are more like noise than defined notes. This makes for a more scratchy overall sound. If you now listen for the rate, rhythm and tone, it should be much easier to identify these three different ticking sounds. I remember a time when on an early spring evening you could hear four or five song thrushes singing in competition from the surrounding rooftops and trees. Unfortunately, now you're lucky if you hear two. Despite this, they're still one of my favourite songsters and they're one of the few birds that start singing as early as January. The song is quite distinctive in that it is constructed of short phrases of repeated notes or syllables with a short silent pause between them and can continue for a long time. Occasionally the phrases contain just one single note or syllable and sometimes as many as six but normally contain just three or four. They can have as many as 80 different phrases in their vocabulary and seem to select randomly from these. The main characteristics to look out for in the Chaffinch's song are a steady increase in the volume of the trills and at the same time a fall in pitch and all ending in an extravagant flourish. I don't make any excuses for talking a lot about spectrograms because I find them extremely useful in analysing bird sounds. As in this example, their short features that are not always obvious when you just listen to the sound and are also helpful in making a mental picture of a song or call to be stored away in your memory. The chaffinch also has a distinct short call that you'll probably have heard called the rain call because it's said to predict the imminent arrival of rain although this is debatable. Before looking at pitch and its relevance to bird song, it's worth spending just a short while to try and understand what sound really is. When an object is made to vibrate, it causes the surrounding air to vibrate at the same rate. These vibrations, or waves of energy, then travel out through the air in all directions, just as they do when you throw a stone into a pond, and the further away they get, the fainter they become. But they're still not sounds, only waves of energy at given frequencies until they are picked up by a receiver such as an ear and are transmitted to the brain that converts the frequencies into what we then recognise as a sound with pitch and tone. 
through a frequency of a sound is the rate of the vibrations or waves over a given period of time, usually expressed in hertz, and the pitch is what the brain interprets and recognises this frequency as. For each rising octave, the frequency of the note is doubled, and this applies to all notes in the scale. Can I ask you to imagine you're listening to a blackbird singing in a tree just 16 metres away, and by passing air over its syrinx, that is no larger than a pea, it is making the air around it vibrate, and these vibrations spread outwards in all directions, including upwards, and dispersing at the same time. By the time these signals reach your ear, they're spread out over an area of 1,600 square metres and as your ear is only collecting signals from an area of about 15 square centimetres. It means that your ear is receiving less than one millionth of the original sound energy generated by the blackbird. And yet your brain can still convert this into the beautiful song of the blackbird. Yet one more of nature's wonders. This reminds me of the old conundrum. If a large tree in the middle of a forest was to fall to the ground, and there was no one near enough to hear it, would there be any sound, or would the tree just crash in silence? Well, the answer to this is both yes and no. It's really a matter of semantics. If when the tree fell, there was no one around to pick up the sound waves and convert them into sound, then there was no sound as we understand it and the tree must have fallen in complete silence. But on the other hand, sound waves were created, and they do have the potential to be converted into sound, maybe by other creatures of the forest. So you could argue that there was sound or noise created when the tree fell. Very conveniently for us, the frequency of most bird vocalisations fall very nicely within the most sensitive part of our hearing range, somewhere between 400 and 3000 Hz. With age, particularly in men, our ability to hear some of these high frequencies is reduced. The high-pitched song of the goldcrest can be a good test for the hearing of men over 40, as apart from being high-pitched, it is also a very quiet song. It's a pity really, as this is often the only indication you get that they are present in the area. The higher pitched songs and calls used by woodland birds may not carry as far, but are more suitable to this environment, as they are usually above the lower frequency background sounds of the wind in the trees. Whereas birds of open country like the raven, who tend to move around a lot over large areas, use much lower frequency calls, as these low frequency calls tend to travel over much longer distances. As we watch the bats take into the air at dusk, we're unable to hear the high pitch frequency echolocation clicks they use to catch moths, as the various frequencies used by bats are all above 20 kilohertz, which is just above the upper limit of our hearing range. The only way we can hear and identify them is with bat detectors, which convert the clicks to an audible frequency. Being able to recognise the tone or quality of a bird's song or call is a great aid in bird identification. Many words are used to describe the tone of the song fish's song. Musical, clear and flute-like, and repetitive, but obviously not monotonous. It emphasises each syllable by repeating it three or four times in each phrase, before moving on to the next one. You should, with a little practice, be able to apply this skill to bird sounds, especially if you just start with some of the more familiar birds in your area. And don't try to remember the song note for note, but just the general tone of the sound. This applies to the great tit in particular. Its most commonly heard song is a repeated high and low two note syllable. 
Don't worry too much at this stage about the pitch of the notes or the number of times the syllable is repeated in each phrase. But try to get a feeling for the tone and repetitive rhythm as there are a number of variations based on this simple song. The basic song is a simple repeated two note syllable with the emphasis on the higher pitched first element of the syllable. In the first variation the syllables are a vertical mirror image of the basic song where the emphasis is placed on the lower pitched second element of the syllable and the overall pitch of the song is higher. Variation 2 has the same elements of high to low syllables as the basic song and the overall pitch is very similar except it rises and falls again over the duration of the phrase and the higher pitched elements have harmonics that the basic song doesn't. Variation 3 is similar to variation 1 with emphasis on the lower elements and has harmonics that variation 2 doesn't and the overall pitch range is much more compressed. There are many more variations to this song and the number of syllables in each phrase can also vary. This is why being able to recognise the tone and rhythm of a song is extremely helpful in identifying birds by their song. This is particularly so with the great tit. I've often heard it said that if you hear a song that sounds a bit familiar but you're unsure of what it is, then the chances are that it's most likely to be a great tit. As you build up a mental library of these sounds, you will start to recognise more and more birds from their songs and calls. This not only helps you identify more birds, but you'll also be alerted when you hear sounds that you're not familiar with. As with a call I heard a few weeks ago that I couldn't place. After a long search through the tree canopy, I finally got a glimpse of the bird. It was a bird that I don't normally associate with sound, as you only usually see it when it silently swoops through the garden. It turned out to be the alarm calls of the sparrowhawk, who had probably got a nest of young ones in the area. I will certainly remember this sound when I hear it again. Here are a few more tricks to help with bird song recognition and they are actually much more easy to apply than they sound. They are mnemonics, synonyms and onomatopoeics. Mnemonics are an aid to memory whereby using a familiar saying or rhyme helps you recall more accurately a less familiar thing. When used in relation to birdsong, it's usually used to help recall the rhythm and tempo of a song. This particular song emanating from the tops of hedgerows and small bushes on one of my favourite walks on Lith Hill epitomises early summer to me. And the well-known mnemonic, a little bit of bread and no cheese, immediately comes to mind as it perfectly fits the rhythm of the Yellowhammer's song with its emphasis on the last drawn out phrase. But outside the breeding season it tends to drop the flourish at the end of the song and just sings the first part. There's also a very simple mnemonic for the great tit and it goes teacher, 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 teacher. I also liken it to the in out sound of a dog's squeaky ball. I've also heard it described as sounding like a squeaky bicycle pump. Synonyms are often used as aids to memory for bird sounds, such as the chatter of house sparrows, describing the short high-pitched sounds made by a group of sparrows communicating with each other. Rattle perfectly describes the flight call of the missile thrush, as it accurately mimics the sound of the old-fashioned wooden rattles used by fans at football matches 
many years ago. Finally we have onomatopoeic names for birds that accurately represent their voices. The Chiffchaff, one of our summer migrants, arrives here in late March and immediately starts to proclaim its rights to a territory by repetitively singing its name, Chiffchaff, Chiffchaff, Chiffchaff. Sometimes it can be quite difficult to visually separate the Willow Warbler and the Chiffchaff as their size and appearance are very similar but fortunately their songs are very different. The Willow Warbler's song has a sweet descending series of notes. As a young lad living in the country this was a sight and sound that I was very familiar with. I only ever knew it by its alternative name of Peewit after its distinctive call. It was only when I got my first bird guide the Little Observer Book of Birds, that I discovered its proper name of Lapwing. I occasionally still call it the Peewit. Lastly, there's one more that we're all familiar with, and that is the Cuckoo. But unfortunately, it's becoming more difficult to hear one, let alone see one. There are sometimes sounds that just stay with you, and this one sticks in my memory. On a slightly hazy, early winter's day, I was walking the dogs over Lith Hill. I couldn't see anything, but I could just make out the very distant, distinctive contact calls of the golden plover. I was finally able to make out a very faint, never-ending ribbon of them approaching the hill. I estimated that there were well over 3,000 in the flock. As they turned and started to circle the hill, the air was filled with their plaintive calls. It was a sight and sound that I'll never forget. For a contact call, it's far more complex than most, and this is what probably gives it that distinctive plaintive tone. The main component is a syllable with an upward inflection for the first element and a downward inflection for the second part. And this is closely followed by a quieter, much higher note. And this is repeated four or five times. If you listen carefully, at the end of each phrase, there's also a scratchy Z sound. The calls have been made by a number of birds, but as you would expect, and can see here in the spectrogram, with such a large number in the flock, synchronization can sometimes be a problem. Now, whenever I walk here, I find myself subconsciously listening out for another chance to see, and especially to hear, this spectacle one more time. Finally, there has to be one spectacle that everyone should try and hear at least once. So one morning in early May, set your alarm for about 4am and get out to some wooded area and treat yourself to one of the wonders of nature, the Dawn Chorus. Unless you've actually stood there and listened to the full chorus of birds, singing their hearts out in full surround sound, greeting the new day. You will have missed out on a truly magical experience. Thank you for watching and listening. And I hope that this video has encouraged maybe just a few more people to get out and enjoy the beautiful bird song that we have everywhere around us.